Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Aggieville Alley Cast Podcast. We'll come rain, shine, or anything in between. We're here to deliver to you the Kansas State sporting news that you so love. I'm Ace Edwards, right alongside Connor Balthazor. And today, welcome to this week's weekly recap, where we're going to cover a little bit of men's basketball, men and women's golf, and of course, the Batcats. With the Batcats probably taking the majority of the time, maybe tied by a men's basketball. And then, of course, everyone's favorite, the wacky segment of the week. But let's go ahead and just dive straight into men's basketball. The first bit of news is a little bit of hardware to hand out. And that belongs to head coach Jerome Tang winning the Naismith Coach of the Year Award, which is the Coach of the Year Award that everyone actually cares about. Because I think Shaka Smart won AP Coach of the Year. Yeah, that's and right. It, it, the near universal response to that was no. <laughs> like even outside of the K State fandom, the near universal response to that was uh uh-uh, uh, shouldn't have been him. But yeah, Tang ends up winning the Naismith Coach of the Year. I I feel like even if I wasn't a K State fan, that was sort of the obvious answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of the uh, voting and finalists for that, that's all decided before the tournament, I think, mainly so that way people don't just randomly pick whoever Cinderella got the furthest. Like, so the, I, I think that's probably some of the logic behind it. Uh, but no, yeah, I mean, obviously, I think Tang, based on year to year success and where we were a year ago uh, and all the incredible stuff he's been able to do in year, I think he was probably the obvious choice to to win this award that plenty of other great coaches uh in college basketball this year but uh drum tang i think he had a year that stood out above the rest even in a year filled with really great coaching jobs which i don't know maybe there should be like a separate award but maybe there is for like interim coach of the year after the job that uh, rodney terry did at texas like granted it was not exactly the most difficult situation in terms of talent but it was a difficult situation in terms of uh just everything situation. going on around the program <laughs> yeah <laughs> no I'll, I'll leave it at that i guess but um no yeah jerome tang he he was fantastic this year uh exceeded pretty much everybody's expectations maybe even his uh but yeah uh, kudos to him also shout out to marquis noel he won the bob Cousy award for uh best point guard yeah yeah so the, those are the again i i feel like the marquis noel one was also pretty obvious but with tang you it's gonna get obnoxious almost to non-k state fans constantly hearing about what he did you know, building a roster that only had two scholarship players or two players in general returning from the previous year and then building an Elite 18. I, <laughs> that, that, that almost never, that's like Ted Lasso level of <laughs> shaboyery that just occurred. <laughs> but yeah, obviously well deserved. Marquise Noel winning uh, point guard of the year. Also very well deserved. I I truly am curious if Marquise ends up getting an NBA look. Because I, I think at, at this point it's got to be certain that he's at least getting a look. Yeah. Um. I I don't feel comfortable saying that he's gonna like make a roster, but I I have at this point it wouldn't be shocking to see a team give him a shot in the summer league and just see what happens because maybe his game ends up translating really well. There's a lot of things he just isn't going to be able to do in the NBA uh, just because of how long and athletic everybody is. So uh, the size will be a big disadvantage, but it doesn't make it impossible for him to perform. There's been short players that have uh, um, had really good careers like uh, Isaiah Thomas and uh, Muggsy Bogues. I'm forgetting a few, I know, but uh, those are two that really stick out in my mind. So, but yeah, I, I I think he'll get at least a shot. Yeah, I do too. That that's pretty much all about the current news. But the to looking a little bit into the transfer portal, there's there's one name in particular that I think is worth mentioning. Also, uh, go subscribe to KSO. They still do 
the the best work in terms of tracking any sort of K-State recruiting in the business. No, they're not paying us and only one of them follows us, but just giving credit where credit's due. Um, and that's LJ Cryer, who is the guard at Baylor. You know, one of the one of the standouts at Baylor who entered the transfer portal officially today. It was sort of an open secret that he was going to enter the transfer portal as of two or three days ago. But the what makes him such an interesting prospect to specifically come to K-State was his lead recruiter while he was at Baylor was Jerome Tang. And we have a very obvious need at experienced guard. So he is uh, scheduled with a visit here, or at least is working on it. The main other contender right now is Houston. And from the, the sound of an interview, maybe KU, uh, just working on scheduling there. If I, if gun to my head, I had to guess today, I would predict he'd probably head to Houston. But you could ask me that in probably 15 minutes and I might change my mind. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think if you're a betting man, the only choices are K-State or Houston as things stand because it seems like KU is kind of in the distant, a pretty distant third. Um, and they're just kind of more flirting and kind of seeing what they want because KU definitely has the room right now. They've lost a lot of guys to the portal this offseason, a few role players. Um, but I, I would love to get LJ Cryer, and I think that it's too early to call um, as things stand right now. Uh, I'd love to make a prediction, but I, I, I think like you, my prediction would change with the wind. So I'm, I'm just not going to make one, but uh, it's still important to note that we are right there uh, for LJ Cryer and getting a first team, all big 12 guy on your roster I've been told is good. So I, I will be very, very happy if we're able to, uh, to land LJ Cryer. Uh, he's a fantastic three point shooter. Defense is okay. Uh, but definitely not a strong suit that the Baylor team, their wings this year, um, their guards, uh, did not have a very good defensive reputation in the, uh, in the big 12, which is kind of unusual for a Scott Drew team, but yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how it unfolds. Uh, it seems like it shouldn't take more than maybe a couple weeks, hopefully, but we'll see. Yeah. And obviously, there, there are a bunch of names, but I again, this is this is public information. Tang's talked about it. He tends to slow play the portal a little bit because he knows that there's going to be names that perhaps surprise people that are you know, going to be better options that come on later on. So I I would urge that people trust Jerome Tang and, you know, don't panic whenever we have like two or th- like, eh, I don't, th- I don't think we make it too far with three open slots. I, I think it's much more likely that we have one open slot and then people are going to panic about the one open slot, forgetting about how in June of last year we had like literally half of a team to full. <laughs> yeah, there was a while last year where we were not going to be able to field a or, or put a, a full five on the court because we got because we had Ish and Marquise. I think Colbert was one of the early ones. Colbert and Cam were two of the first to come in. Yeah. And that then we had a pretty long wait after that to get other commits and guys i think as i recall by long i mean like it was like a month but it it was longer than i think most people were comfortable with having just four guys on your team it was understandable but uh so but we have that experience now we know how jerome tang operates so um patience is key um and and the portal, I, I guess, is the best way to look at it. And there's some really great names in the portal right now, of course. Uh, um, we already said LJ Cryer. Uh, Max A. Smith of uh, Oral Roberts. Uh, he, the guard from Houston. Um, Tremont Marks. Okay. Uh, he's kind of a Cam Carter clone from what I can tell. Um, it is, doesn't have eye-popping numbers. like He's in like a elite shooter or anything, but he's got good size. 
and he has a reputation as a good defender, which anybody, any Houston guard for the most part is going to be a good defender because they were one of the best defensive teams in the country this year. I think they allowed less than 60 a game, but um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely a few options out there. Uh, I know drum team really wants a, uh, a big, and I, I remember seeing the things that he listed for like, uh, like traits that he wants in a big and he wants them to do literally every single thing like yeah. an elite level and say, I want that too. <laughs> but be cool. I, I don't know if we can expect that guy to go walk into the portal and also be in our uh, uh, budget. So, <laughs> but I, I'm excited to see how the portal develops. I think we, um, if I had to pick something right now, I'd say I do think we get at least one of the LJ Cryer Max Asmus combo. Um, I, I, it, it seems like both are really interested in the program and they're both one year guys that can go to a different program, prove they can do it elsewhere and then move on to the next level. So, and drum saying wants to get old and he wants to stay old. So they fit that profile too. Yep. That That's pretty much all we have to say about men's cats ball. Now we can talk about men's golf. And a little bit of uh, a little bit of a slip in how they've normally finished in these past couple of weeks and months. They ended up tying for eighth at the Mossy Oak Classic, which, like, given their their recent performances, that is a little bit of a slip. I do believe that that's still somewhat middle of the pack for the Mossy Oak, but it was yeah you know, they're they're not used to finishing that low, especially recently. I don't even think their their stroke counts were particularly great. So I I think it was just a a messy day at the fairway for the uh for the the club cats. It is worth noting that every team that they finished behind is ranked and they tied for eighth with another ranked squad. And they were eight out of eighteen, so right about in the middle or tied for eight out of eighteen. So they did have a they they separated themselves from the unranked squads um and were good but they weren't great i i, I think you put it well it's probably not quite up to the standards that we want uh for them uh but regardless they they still were okay at the very least um will hopkins he led the way um, at minus six, Cooper Schultz was right behind him at minus five. Um, but yeah, this was a this was a big opportunity to really uh, make a name for ourselves, and we just weren't quite able to break through in the way that we needed to. Um, still had some okay individual performances, but we really needed like one person to really break out and have a fantastic day. Um, but. Unfortunately, we were not quite able to do that, but um, where it was a really crowded field um, with some really good teams. So you can't be too upset with that finish, but I think it also does take people back to earth on the uh, uh, men's golf natty right now because we were at minus 18, but we were also 22 strokes behind the winner, uh, which is uh, number 15, Tennessee, uh, and then number four, Auburn. They were minus 39. So we were a ways off of that winning pack, but we were solidly in the uh, kind of secondary pack of uh, teams. Yeah. Which, you know, it could be worse, certainly could be better. So that's pretty much all for the, the men's club cats, the women's club cats. They competed at the ultimate golfing event and venue. That is, of course, <laughs> the Bruzzy. <laughs> they ended up finishing eighth at the Bruzzy. Uh, predictably, North Texas at their, you call it home field, home green. I don't think you can call it that because it's in Oklahoma. So <laughs> They claim it, though. I, I refuse to call that their home course because it's not even the same state so <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna allow that <laughs> yeah uh north texas ends up getting first it is worth noting that k-state gets eighth out of 15th that's middle of the pack 
uh, one below number 36 in the country, Houston, and one better than number 35 in the country, TCU. Ended up shooting um, 27 over par, so 97 strokes on a par 70. Uh, again, sort of a mid-range. I would honestly, the, the women's team has had a little bit of a tough season this year for the women's golf team. I'd, I'd say that's fine. That's about average. It's about what I'd expect. The upside for them is that they do actually, for the first time, get to participate in um, a conference play or a conference match play. Match play. There it is. Thank you, Connor. <laughs> I saw the tweet about it today. Yeah. So, but, yeah, okay. I mean, it, it is what it is. I'm just happy we get to compete in the Brezzy personally. Honestly, just getting to be there is half the fun. Uh, and also, this must be this must have been a really hard course because it's listed as a par seventy. Um, but the winner of the uh, competition went plus sixteen, yeah. and that's North Texas. So, um, pretty unbelievable. Yeah, they uh, there was only par there. <laughs> yeah, there was one golfer that says that the entire meet that uh, broke par uh, went minus two, and uh, apparently somebody had a hole in one. Uh, I don't know if I believe it because it says it's someone from Oklahoma State. And according to the team leaderboard, Oklahoma State was not there. So, oh, <laughs> it may have been Oklahoma. Um, but I, I I don't know whether to believe that or not. Oh, could have been an individual competition, I guess. Um, but I don't know. Still a, a respectable outcome. Of course, you'd love to win the Brezzy to take home the Brezzy trophy, but. Uh, that would be pretty great to add to the uh, the trophy case, but fortunately, we just weren't quite able to do so. I don't think we would ever stop mentioning it if any of our golf teams won the Brezzy. I if we were to win the Brezzy, I think that we might have to like go take a picture with it, like we did with the Big Twelve Championship <laughs> trophy, like for football. Like we'd have to like tour the state with this thing if we won the Brezzy. That's my view, at least. Yeah, obviously. You have to bring it on a catbacker tour specifically for the golf team. <laughs> I'd go. I, I'd go get a picture with the Brezzy trophy. Oh, pff, I absolutely would, too. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> that would be a fun time. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that that's the women's club cats. Now we get to talk about the bat cats. The the first series, you, know, you can tell the, the, the inflection there already. The first series was a one to two split in favor of West Virginia. Uh, first game was a loss for the Batcats, three to eight. Second game was a pretty convincing win, seven to one. Third game just couldn't quite put it all together, six to ten. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this series first because it is number twenty four in the country, West Virginia. They're a good team, a solid team, even if their coaching style does really just drive me up a wall. Because if you gave up a single walk as a West Virginia pitcher, you'd be taken out of the game. And that includes if you were down or up five. So it it was that part was frustrating because it felt like they were doing the equivalency of kneeling out the clock, realizing that there's no clock in baseball. <laughs> but I think the worst part about this game was that a lot of it came down and felt like just a lot of missed opportunities because you get two, you get two big home runs in the first inning from Brendan Jones and Kalen Culpepper. And then you have a massive scoring drought from innings two to six. And then the only game that you come in, that you score the rest of the game was off of a bases loaded walk. And then we can't capitalize any further in that bases loaded scenario, which that is by far the story of this entire series was just the amount of missed opportunities we had. We had nine players left on base in the first game. But, you know, it. we can go through game by game because, honestly, that we are, we're at the point of the year where we can afford to do that, plus it's conference play, plus otherwise episodes would be like 25 minutes. So, <laughs> yeah, I... First game, Owen Borama. He, this is the the first start since 
uh, Stephen F. Austin, where he, he kind of showed a lot of cracks. And it, it's mostly just because he was getting he was getting hit off of a lot, and Pete Hughes just wanted him to go his six. And that said, it wasn't like he had one god awful inning. It was just, and this is West Virginia's style of play where they're going to every single inning get at least one. So you, every single game against West Virginia is a war of attrition. And unfortunately, the first game was just a loss in the war of attrition. Yeah, they just chipped away uh, in that first game. Uh, Super, super frustrating, especially after starting uh, the game, bottom of the first, uh, first pitch, uh, Brendan Jones uh, goes yard. Yeah, then Kalen Culpepper goes as well, uh, and he gets a home run of his own. So we led that game early. West Virginia ties it up, but yeah, then they just keep chipping away and then build a seven to two lead before we ever get back to it. But we blow multiple bases loaded opportunities uh, in this game. Borma, yeah, like the stat line's not great. Seven earned and six isn't good. Um, he had six strikeouts, only had one walk, gave up 10 hits. But yeah, West Virginia just slowly and steadily built that lead. Um, and we really struggled against uh, Ben Hampton for the most part. West Virginia starter. He went six and two thirds, 121 pitches, 10 strikeouts. That was a career high tying mark for him. But yeah, this was a really frustrating game. Um, you hate to lose it at home. It was a sellout, allegedly, uh, or at the very least, it was very close to capacity because um, we are 2,300 uh, in attendance. So you hate to drop a game eight to three in front of a really packed crowd. Um, but yeah, this was a frustrating one to watch, uh, especially to blow multiple bases loaded opportunities. Uh, that really hurts. Uh, so I was really disappointed um, in that regard. I was really hoping that we would be able to put together a, a better showing uh, than that, uh, especially against such a highly ranked team, such a, such a, such a big opportunity to get a, a ranked squad uh, at home uh, in big 12 play, uh, which is where we're supposed to dominate and be really good. Um, but really felt like we let this one slip away. Yeah. The next game was significantly better. Uh, this was a 7-1 to victory in favor of K-State. This was also very close to a capacity crowd. And this was by far the most impressive that Herman Fajardo has probably looked in his K-State career. And I'm saying that considering the starts that he made, and I believe like the one nutty relief appearance that he had against some random school like towards the very end, when he was nails. Like he... The number one problem with Herman has always been consistency. But when he's on, he is lethal. And that's what he was this game. He ends up going seven, striking out three, only one earned run, one hit batter. Um, and then, of course, Tyson Neighbors, he came in in the eighth. Uh, he was going to close out the game, going to get a six inning save. Then uh, we sort of we sort of blew them up in the the eighth inning for three more runs. So we let the bus bus take them to loser town. So it was, this was definitely, it's the best game of the series, not only because it case eight won, but it, it was such a good game to the extent that there isn't really much that we could truly say about it because it was just a collection of really solid appearances plus five individual K state home runs. <laughs> Yeah, Fajardo was awesome. Uh, going just under 100 pitches, six strikeouts, three walks, uh, going seven innings. He's kind of had a, and, and you put it well, consistency has been his issue. He normally starts games well, but he kind of loses, uh, loses that energy after three to four innings normally. He doesn't really ever get past five, uh, but going uh, seven was awesome. Um, and then batting, uh, Roberto Pena was uh, really great uh, two for two and drew two walks uh, had a uh, uh, a home run as well that, that uh, was a the lot home of, run that hit yeah. the, the volleyball facility yeah it was uh, that one 469 feet um, absolute destruction of that home run 
Uh, but he and then he drew a bases loaded walk as well. Uh, he ended up being National Player of the Week last week, uh, which yeah, was for, for fascinating. <laughs> fascinating because we went two and three, and we had the National Player of the Week. Uh, he had a OPS of like two point two something, which is just ludicrous. Because like really good is like all is getting around one point oh, so he doubled what is like a, considered to be a good OPS. Yeah. So. Like unheard of stuff. He was like a Hall of Famer for like five games. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and but yeah, this is uh, just we couldn't stretch this type of performance out over over the week and or over the weekend, the full weekend, unfortunately. Um everyone else kind of was all right, uh spotty, I guess, in terms of batting. A lot of people went one for whatever. Um Kalen Culpepper is the only batter to not get on base. Uh, for us that day but yeah did have five no. home runs though between dom hughes nick goodwin brady day rafael pelletier and roberto pena yeah uh that's really really good uh two home runs in the eighth as well um so that was that was really awesome to kind of continue to build on it their only thing that was unfortunate i guess is that they were all solo home runs yeah. so yeah we have five round, uh, five home runs but you only get five runs out of it Obviously, you'd like to get more, but hey, you're never going to complain about a home run. So, yeah. So that was the second game. Uh, third game, that another. It was a Mountaineers ended up winning this one. It was ten to six, and really, it it should have been ten to four. the The last two runs that K State scored were in the bottom of the ninth. It was the equivalency of a garbage time touchdown. So. <laughs> this one was frustrating to me. And the main reason I say that is because even though it didn't, there technically wasn't as many runners left on base. It was six compared to the nine on the first day. It just never really felt like we were in this one. And a lot of it came down to errors. The the normally rely, well, Cash usually has had his moments in right field. Like whenever he's asked to throw the ball, he's great, but fielding is not his strong suit. So Colin Rothermel in his first appearance of the year, I uh, like literally not even thrown relief before this. Uh, he ends up giving up two earned runs, but three unearned runs off of a cash usually error. And then it was kind of all downhill from there. <laughs> I, it felt like it, by the time we put Ty Rule in in like the sixth inning, it was like, yeah, all right. Yeah, they win this game. They win the series, which is a shame. But, you know, Roberto Pena had two home runs this game. I apologize. I misspoke earlier. This was the day he hit the 469 bomb. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, my bad. But yeah, this... There isn't much to say for this one for the opposite reason as the the second game in the series. There isn't much to say with this one because nothing notably good happened. (laughs) Yeah, this was a really unfortunate game. Uh, Roberto Pena, yeah, he goes two for two, five RBI, get the two home run and walks twice. Uh, So he did something good with all of his plate appearances. Brady Day continues to do nothing but draw walks. Uh, his his walk to K ratio is just absolutely nuts. Isn't it four now? Um, he's a, about thirty walks and a, about I think eleven strikeouts right now. He's somewhere in that department, but he he has just been incredible at uh, at least not striking out. But yeah, there is not a lot to write home about in this game. Uh, we had that lead briefly uh, in the second, but then a West Virginia home run in the third to carry that pretty quickly. Wentworth was pretty solid out of the bullpen. Uh, two earned in three and two thirds uh, with three strikeouts. Uh, pretty solid there. Um, but yeah, it was really frustrating to let this series go. A little embarrassing, too, because we were the first Big 12 school to lose a home series all year. So not 
an enviable position to be in, um, especially after it seemed like we were starting to build some momentum with the Oklahoma series. Um, but we well, are right back to square one yet again with the back cats. So, uh, no, we're considering what happened after this game. We're not at square one. We're at square zero. Fair enough. But now this is a really disappointing series to drop because uh, we had every opportunity to take this one. Yeah. All right. <sighs> it's that time again. <laughs> it's that time again. It's there's one more game to cover. It was a K-State loss up against Nebraska, six to one at home. Is it as embarrassing as the steep uh the St. Thomas loss? No. Should we have lost to Nebraska? Absolutely not. Should we have gotten out attended by Nebraska fans? Also, absolutely not. And I, I know the, the counter argument, oh, is Nebraska's not a bad team. They were 15-9-1 entering this game. Don't ask me how they tied. I don't know. Um, They're fine. They're better than they were last year. But this is one of those games where it's at home. You have to at least put up a fight. Like this was genuinely a painful game to sit through. And I'm not talking about because it was just cold. <laughs> Cause it did get cold towards the end. It kind of sucked actually. Um, but just everything that could possibly have gone wrong did. Mason Buss only gives up one earned run, gets the tough luck loss. Blake Corsentino gives up two earn. Shea Hardis does his job and gets two-thirds of scoreless ball, actually getting two strikeouts. Then Cole Weissenmaker hits one guy. And then Andrew Evans comes in the last inning and gives up uh, two solo shots. It, But I would honestly make the argument that the pitching wasn't the problem today. You know, yeah, sure, you gave up six runs. But K-State has been and always will be at this point under Pete Hughes be a power-hitting team. It's going to be one of those teams that truly tries to embrace three-outcome baseball where you either walk, strike out, or hit a home run. Or you're going to bunt some guy on base, occasional sacrifices, those are the exceptions. It's just, there, there's the bats being cold, and then there's the bats being hilariously ineffective. You know, shout out Cash Rugely going three for four. You are the only positive performance from the offense today. Brady, Brady Day drew three walks. <laughs> one, go, one for two. Yeah. But there are two positives. Yeah, two uh, positives. Not that it matters because it, it just doesn't. Yeah. But I want to give Brady Day's credit for just drawing a ton of walks. Yeah. I think it's really funny. Yeah. Conveniently, batters number one and two were the, the two bright spots. Kalen Culpepper draws the exceedingly rare 0 for 5. Uh, I think Kalen Culpepper is having, like, he's he's where everyone else was in the middle of March because he got hurt. I think he'll be fine. He just needs to acclimate. He had one of the best defensive days of, as a K-State third baseman I've seen. He was fantastic defensively. He made so many really, really good plays uh, at the hot corner. And frankly, that whole side of the infield, uh, third and short, has been really good this year. And yeah. Goodwin has taken a huge defensive step this year. Yeah. And he deserves credit for that because we have um, definitely not been his biggest defensive fans in the past. Uh, <laughs> you can just say me, man. I dumped yeah. on him for like two years. Yeah. And to be fair, he did deserve it because he was a uh, unrefined defender. But we'll put it like that. No, he was um, trash. No, he was... <laughs> they can be synonyms. But yeah. Anywho. <laughs> But he's um, really developed. He's really good as a yeah. defender now. Yeah, he's been really, really good. And Cole Pepper is the same. But they want to combine one for nine at the plate. Uh, that's pretty. That's pretty yucky. <laughs> if you ask me. <laughs> um. Yeah. So Nick Goodwin one for four. Kojo zero oh, for four. Kojo's gotten cold again, unfortunately. Uh, Roberto Pena gets named that Big Twelve Player of the Week. National Player of the National Week. National Player of the Week. And, and Big 12. 
Ofer, yeah. <laughs> Ofer. Ofer with two strikeouts. One of them was really bad. Uh, one of those ABs where you just swing at everything that's not in the zone and just watch everything through the zone. Just one of those, just you, you want to just like put your head in your palms and just like pretend it's not happening. But, yeah. and Cole Johnson, the way he's swinging the bat right now, it honestly feels like when he makes contact with the ball, it's like, look, like, I don't even say that to be mean. It's just his demeanor in the box is not good. He looks stiff in the box. He he does not look comfortable at all. Like, like granted, he can really get the whole, he, he can get a hold of, of a baseball sometimes and he'll send them flying. Like and in the fall, he was clocked at getting a 500 footer in a scrimmage. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to see that again, please. But he he just doesn't really look comfortable in the box at all right now, uh, which we he's someone I think we really – he has to get going uh, right now. But he left three on base, uh, went over. Really tough performance from him. Yeah. Then Jaden Lobliner, the, the true freshman, he ends up DHing. He goes one for two, uh, ends up getting pinch hit for Dom Hughes. Then didn't, uh, work. <laughs> didn't work. Uh, Brendan Jones started probably as the best player on the team. He's cooled off quite a bit. Uh, he went one for four, two strikeouts. Caden Phillips, 0 for two, ends up getting subbed out for Rafael Pelletier. Yeah, it. We ended up giving seven total hits, and like maybe two of those hits were against a true freshman who entered the game with a 17, six ERA. You can't have that. No. no and like, the, this is a bad, 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 bad game. Yeah. I, I, part of me wants to do the thing where I melt down again, because it seems like every single time I end up melting down on the show they end up when winning we decide, the next series. When we decide to start talking bad about a non-rev sport, they immediately go on like and, and, to, and they go on to have like one of the best performances they've had all year. Like we did that I think with women's basketball. I think we did that and then they beat Iowa State. Like Yeah, they did, they beat Iowa. Yeah. And uh, we we've seen that plenty of times where the second that we decide to start melting down, uh then all of a sudden it's like they hear it and uh, then they they go out and perform. So back at it for listening. This is us melting down. Uh, and we'd really <laughs> like you to win this weekend series. <laughs> Honestly, take a game. Take a game. Be yeah. competitive in a game even. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, the next series is against Texas down in Austin. Number 21 in the country, Texas. I'm projecting a sweep. <laughs> I think that's it's fair. not in our favor. <laughs> I truly cannot recall the last time we picked up a game uh, in Austin. Uh, I I do remember last time we were down there, we nearly beat them uh, in at least one game, but then we just exploded like in a bad way in <laughs> the eighth inning. Oh yeah. Cause we took a lead and the top of the eighth and then Tyler Eckberg just disintegrated oh, and gave right. up eight gave up eight in the eighth and, and then we then literally we never and six. then we literally never saw him again yeah but that was number three texas so this texas team allegedly not as talented this texas team had some struggles uh early in the year um that's really the only bright spot i guess um is that they at one point in the season were not good you know i say i say it's been a long time since we beat them we actually uh, took the series in 2019 on the road. So I don't remember that happening at all. This was against number 14, number 14, Texas. We beat them. Griffin Hassel gets the win in that game. He was the number one starter. <laughs> uh, he, oh. And Will Brennan, who is on the uh, Cleveland Guardians roster, he had the yeah. save. Because he was a utility two way two way player, and then Jordan Wicks got the win on day two. Uh, I think that was his true freshman year. Huh? Griffin yeah. Hassel, I think, is still on the team. He is. He uh, has a season ending injury right now, uh, so not going to see him this year. 
uh, unfortunately, but he he is on the team. You are correct. Uh, we will just not be seeing him. He will be medically registered. <laughs> I I guess so. Uh, one way or another, he is not going to be pitching for the KC Wildcats this year. Yeah. Yeah, that is the that's all the news for this week. Now we can get into the wacky segment of the week. And this week's question is, if you were forced to, keyword is forced to, replace royal purple in all of K-State's designs with a different color, what would that color be? Worth noting, you can pick different shades of purple so long as it is not literally just royal purple, but slightly brighter, slightly darker. Okay. Um the knee-jerk reaction with anything K-State rebranding nowadays is just to say lavender and for good reason because it looks good. I'm not going to say that for that reason because I think it's lazy. But <laughs> um I'm gonna take this as a we have to rebrand K-State completely. Mm-hmm. Like and just choose a completely different color and like have some sort of justification. Yeah. The justification will be that I like it. And <laughs> um, if I had to pick a color or I'll, I'll say like a color combo, I've always been a sucker for like orange and black. So I'm really like Oregon State's uniforms, really like Oklahoma State's uniforms. Um, if there's anybody from Humboldt, Kansas, uh, I liked your uniforms in like 2011 when they <laughs> came on the road to play uh, um, St. Mary's in Pittsburgh. Because I remember thinking that whole game, I like their uniforms. And then they lost by like 30. But I, I thought the uniforms were good. I, I thought their uniforms were cool and it stuck with me. But yeah, I've always been a big fan of orange and black combos. Uh, my Spartan and Halo Reach was always orange and black. Uh, so I have proof of this concept. But uh, I don't know if that actually works as a whole. Like th- it isn't really tied to anything. I don't think it's literally just me deciding that I'd like that. That That's pretty much it. Honestly, yellow and black of Wichita state didn't already have. It would be good because uh, like prairie grass and then black happens to go with that. So that if Wichita state didn't already have that, that's probably something I'd lean towards, but I'll say orange and black. Yeah. You see, I'm, I am more than willing to steal from Wichita State at least the primary color of that that sort of wheat yellow, you know that sort of drained saturated yellow, and the accent color that I would actually go for, I do kind of agree with you. I would actually go with like a slight orange, so like you have the burnt wheat yellow with the accent of maybe like a, a more muted orange, not Texas burnt orange but something like in that same vein. And obviously you have to pay the homage to the, the agricultural roots there with the, the color of the wheat. Like the only other option I could think of was just straight yellow, but I don't want to match Iowa state. So, and, and that's just cause I don't really like them. If it were Oklahoma state, I would be fine with matching with them because we we basically treat we the fan base treats each other like we're brothers anyway. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. Yeah, I I'd, I'd go with like a, a yellow and orange, I'd say. I'm not promising that it would look great because I think the one solid purple is probably the best look unless you were just to embrace like go all black or maybe silver. Ooh, silver. Silver would be interesting. Um Another trying to think about other like alternatives that we could run with something sunset related could be fun. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm trying to think about how that would actually translate to like logos and on the field and like designs like mixing like a sort of like sunset purpley ready orangey thing like but I'm trying to figure out how you mix all those colors. Hmm? You could do it like a gradient working from the bottom of the logo up. That is possible. I think that would look terrible, but I think it, it could. <laughs> no, I feel like, I, no, I, no, I feel like there'd be some upside to that. You think so? I, yeah. I don't know. The way I'm seeing it in my head just doesn't look good, but I'm also thinking like Microsoft Paint because like <laughs> I, I don't know anything about like designing. So 
I don't know. Maybe that, that, that'd be a fun concept to do sometime. But I don't know. Sunset related stuff, Flint Hills related stuff, uh, um, ag related stuff. Maybe we could just become brown and be the cow pies or something like that. Uh, I don't like just, that one. Oh. <laughs> I think it'd be fun personally, but I don't know. You do you, man. But <laughs> though, those are those are some of my suggestions, I guess. Yeah. You have anything else to add about anything? Um, I hope we get LJ Cryer and Max Acemas because then I will be buying tickets to the national championship preemptively. All right. I wouldn't stop you. But that pretty much wraps up this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cap podcast. Thank you all so much for listening. If you want to contact or follow the show, you can follow us on Twitter or Instagram at Aggieville A Cats. That's capital A, capital A, and capital C and Cats. If you want to email us, we're AggievilleAlleyCats at gmail.com. If you want to follow us on a more personal note, I am at AC Edwards 00. I am at Connor Balthazor, capital C, capital B. And if you want to support the show financially, please be sure to check out the official Aggieville Alley Cats merch store, where you can find such designs as the staff approved Doom Tang Clan, Play Sandstorm Cowards, and Neon Alley Cats. But most importantly, thank you all for listening to this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. Where come rain, shine, or anything in between, we're here to deliver to you the Kansas State sporting news that you so love. Stay safe, Alley Cats.